All right, everyone. Um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. All Welcome, right, everyone. To this... um... Oops, sorry. Welcome to this new uh, edition of the Worldwide um, Neuro uh, Forum. Today's guest is uh, uh, Oscar Marin. Welcome, Oscar. Uh, Oscar is a, a professor of neurobiology. He's um, the head of the developmental neurobiology and director of the MRC Center for Neurodevelopmental Disorders at King's College in, in London. Oscar graduated in biology from the Universidad Complutense in Madrid, where he also obtained a PhD in neuroscience. And uh, this was followed by a postdoc with, uh, within John Rubenstein's lab at, at UCSF. There's um, some level of lineage with our two previous speakers, Sonia Garel, whom you heard uh, last week, also trained with, uh, with, uh, with John and uh, Guillet at some point was uh, a PhD, a postdoc in in in, uh, in Oscar's lab. So there's there there's some lineage uh, relationships there. So Oscar was a group leader uh, at the Institute of Neuroscience in Alicante prior to joining King's College in 2014. As you'll hear uh, during his presentation, his main focus of interest is, um, uh, I mean, the main broad focus of interest is the development of the cortex, with a particular focus on on cortical interneurons, on the generation of diversity in this very uh, interesting uh, population of cells and uh, mechanisms relating to plasticity and to disease. In 2005, he was selected as one of the founding members of the Scientific Council of the ERC, where he served until 2010. And currently, he's a Wellcome Trust investigator, an ERC Advanced Grant, grant Awardee, and a member of the board of reviewing editors at Science. And I would like to add on my own, in addition to this, and above all, He's a great guy, so great to have you here, uh, Oscar. Thank you, Denis. So before um, I um, I give um, Oscar um, the, the stage, um, there's and this is something he he and I discussed together. I'd like to take the opportunity of, of this forum for for something more sober and in fact a, a very very sad. Uh, and say a few words about my dear friend Alexandre Dyer, uh, who passed away under tragic and unexpected circumstances a little bit over a, a week ago. So Alexandre was a, a close friend and a colleague. I, I will miss him dearly. Uh, but more directly relevant to today's forum, he was an outstanding uh, scientist and clinician uh, with an adm admirable work ethics. Uh, which I think uh, can serve as an, an insp inspiration to many of us, and in particular to students, postdocs, or MD-PhD students in the audience who uh, aim at bridging a clinical, a clinical and a basic neuroscientific um, career. Alexandre obtained his medical degree from the University of Geneva in, 19, in 1999, and he did his postdoc in Heather Cameron's lab at the NIH, uh, where he studied postnatal neurogenesis. Uh, back in Geneva, he joined Joseph Kish's laboratory looking at plasticity of different cell types in the developing neocortex. That's where his interest for this structure arose, using in particular uh, elegant transplantation approaches. And then he set up his own lab here where he focused um, uh, on the diversity of cortical interneurons. And I think uh, um, we'll hear from Oscar throughout his talk uh, about some of the contributions he made to the field, in particular, um, with regard to the origins of some very uh, precise subtypes of, of, uh, of cortical interneurons and on the role of serotonin in cell migration. So as a psychiatric and a neuroscientist, um, um, Alexandre combined, you know, daily basic, on a daily basis, basic research and clinical um, activities. He was seeing uh, patients twice a week uh, and, and managed to successfully develop both of these aspects. And this, um, you know, dual approach to psychiatry, bridging the neuron with the patient and his, her symptoms, uh, led him to a, a number of, of prestigious positions, uh, acquire a number of prestigious positions, including um, leading the Synapse Center, um, which is um, a, a Swiss consortium aiming at promoting research in the field of psychiatric neuroscience. Uh, one only has to read the comments and testimonials on, on Twitter and other social media from around the world and talk to the member of his labs to realize uh, what an attentive, generous and caring pe person he was. Um, his lab reflected his openness to others. He was ready to take, take risks to welcome students with unusual backgrounds to give them a chance in their own lives, uh, exposing himself to, to better help others. 
Uh, he was a great human being, and I, as I think uh, Alain Chedotal wrote on, on Twitter uh, upon his desk, he was someone great to hang out with that meeting, and I, I guess um, maybe the two actually go hand in hand. Um, one day, you know, when I had turned to him for, for advice, I was dis dissatisfied with my own performance or irritated by someone's behavior. Alexander answered me, you know, with a little sparkle in the eyes. You know, Denny, uh, what makes people interesting are the ways in which they are imperfect. And um, this is a vision that's really full of hopes, full of positivism, positive is, oh, I'll get it, positivism um, with regard to humankind. It really deeply moved me. And I think um, this kind of thinking can guide many of us in our daily dealings with the challenges of academic life. Um, Alexandre, I will miss you dearly. I know many of us will. Uh, you have left way too soon, but we are grateful, grateful for what you have given us and our thoughts are with your family. Alexandre and, and Oscar um, knew each other well. Um, and as fate would have it, it turns out Oscar is on, on stage today, which strangely is a little bit of a, of a heartwarming thought. So uh, Oscar, thanks for, for being here on this uh, somewhat special uh, edition and uh, really looking forward to your presentation. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Denis, and thank you very much for these uh, words uh, for our friend Alex, um, uh, which, uh, you know, who we will remember very dearly. Um, I don't want to add anything uh, to what Denis has said, because I think it summarized beautifully um, everything that we uh, think. Uh, I'll, I'll try to talk about a bit of his science as we go along, because I think that's also an important uh, measure of uh, his uh, uh, his contributions. Um, and I'll, I'll try to elevate the spirits, um, uh, you know, going ahead through my talk. Uh, um, you know, I realize that it's, it's you know, fairly uh, difficult for our entire community, and I hope that we can navigate it. Um, Maybe to change the uh, uh, pace a little bit, I just want to respond live to Alan that you know I haven't managed to get my Napoleon uh, uh, costume uh, on time because probably because of the lockdown. But, but I promise to take pictures uh, uh, with it um, as soon as uh, it arrives. Um, it's it's one of my favorite uh, characters in history, so uh, <laughs> I think it was a very wise uh, choice by the knee. Um, let me share my screen and, and let me get going. Um, uh, let me see if I can actually do this. Um, uh, Danny, can you can you see my? Yeah, I think after seven editions, you're the first one that actually manages from you know beginning to end. So beautiful. Congratulations! It's all good. Um, you're um, ready to go. Fantastic. Um, let me put my time on so I I know um, how long I'm taking. Um, I think the neuroscientists have been, you know, fascinated by the cerebral cortex ever since um, uh, Ramon y Cajal. I think that, you know, this drawing um, on cell types in the cerebral cortex kind of has been inspiring, um, um, you know, generations of neuroscientists uh, over the last century uh, or so. And it's quite interesting that quite early in, in, in you know, the uh, study of the cerebral cortex, we realized that uh, the cerebral cortex is, you know, especially in human, and this is taken from Broadman, uh, and now um, is a very heterogeneous uh, uh, place. And, you know, we very early on recognize a huge diversity or heterogeneity in the site architecture organization of the, uh, of the cortex. And, and despite this idea of heterogeneity, uh, one thought that has dominated generally uh, again for the last few decades is the idea of canonical microcircuits in cortical function, and this is you know taken from now uh, you know uh, fairly uh, aged uh, review, but it kind of summarizes kind of this idea of trying to understand how cortical circuits um, um, are built and how they operate to process. Uh, information, and uh, I think one one of the problems with this type of, of approach is that first it kind of dismisses a little bit the way um, you know other studies have shown um, uh, you know heterogeneity in this area of cortex, but also you know the fact that you know inputs and outputs are summarized in very schematic ways as you know inhibition and excitation uh, coming into a particular layer like layer two three there. Um, so I guess that if we want to make progress in understanding 
canonical microcircuits, and I would uh, you know highlight the idea that probably every cortical area to a large extent has probably more than just one uh, canonical microcircuit, and those are slightly different you know across different areas. We need to have a better understanding of uh, cell types, not just uh, inhibitory and citatory, but every single cell type. And very importantly, too, and even though I will not touch on this uh, during my talk, uh, the actual numbers, you know, the numbers and the motifs are going to be very important to dissect out these microcircuits um, uh, in different cortical areas. Um, as, as you all know, these cell cortex have two main uh, classes of, of neurons, and so far so good. You know, pyramidal cells, excitatory cells. There are about eighty percent of the neurons in the cortex, and um, local circuit um, GABAergic interneurons represent uh, roughly the remaining twenty percent. Um, the problem is when you go down uh, to the next level of uh, of sparsity, then you know problems start to arise. And and taking this from uh, the last published release from the Alim. Um, uh, Brain Institute uh, to um, to reflect, you know, what interneurons look like from a transcriptional perspective. And as you can see there, um, you can see up to sixty different transcriptional uh, profiles here. You have organized it horizontally. These are layers here in this uh, um, uh, vertical uh, row, and you can see relative densities of these different cell types across all this uh, space. So it's a huge diversity of cell types, and this is only taking into consideration inhibitory cells. Now, as you can see in this kind of cladistic dendrogram, um, there are six major subclasses of um, GABAergic uh, neurons in the cortex, and they are recognized by specific genes, um, for example, some other statin cells, parable booming fast spiking cells, LAM5, and so on and so forth. So even within one of these subclasses, for example, fast packing interneurons, um, we are already able to identify a you know, very important diversity, at least from the transcriptional point of view. I'd like to, just like to, to highlight that perhaps this uh, huge transcriptional diversity do not correlate uh, perfectly well with the specific identities. And then some of these transcriptional uh, profiles may actually identify states in uh, the same type of neuron. But even, even so, even considering that some of these profiles may actually reflect in a state of a cell and not really an identity, uh, we're still dealing with a fairly massive um, uh, problem. And because these cells are connected in very peculiar ways and they have input and outputs that are quite specific, you begin to understand you know, how the uh, uh, oversimplification of a canonical circuit um, will require to, you know, massive amount of information to, uh, to actually uh, take it to uh, a really appropriate kind of level. So if you look at the picture on, on, on the right, chandelier cells, as you put things in context, that only represents one of these many, many transcriptional um, identities. Where do the cells come from uh, during development? So what we learned over the last 20 years or so, and this emerged uh, primarily from work in John Robinson lab by Stuart Anderson, uh, is that both pyramidal cells and interneurons populated in the neocortex come from different um, uh, uh, unlocks and, and different embryonic uh, uh, populations. Pyramidal cells from the pallium of the telencephalon and interneurons, GABA cells, primarily from uh, the subpallium uh, of, uh, of the telencephalon. And over the last 20 years or so, um, you know, work from many, many different laboratories have worked to establish through a number of different profiles and experiments, transplantation experiments, tracing experiments, genetic labeling experiments to identify where the different populations, where the different subclasses of interneurons actually come from specifically within the uh, subpallium of the telencephalon. And you have here a little diagram with uh, two of the major um, subclasses, parabolin fast spiking cells and somatostatin cells deriving from the medial ganglionic eminence. And a bunch of other um, subclasses of interneurons characterized actually by the expression of, uh, of one serotonin receptors uh, coming from older sources within the uh, subpallium. And it's in that, uh, you know, in this context, in these type of experiments, I'd like you to, uh, to remind you of some of uh, Alex the, uh, work and, um, just to you know, follow on on Denise's uh, words, not only about you know the kind of person you know uh, uh, that Alice uh, was, the, uh, one friend to you know to consider and to maintain, and a beautiful uh, uh, person. He has done very remarkable work over the last uh, uh, few years, and, and just want to bring one piece of of that recent work just uh, to remind you of his of his uh, uh, work. And this actually all come down from uh, one study that we did. Um, 
you know, more than 10 years ago, we identify expressing of uh, capital transcription factors very specifically in the preotic region of the embryonic telling cephalon, as you can see in this slide. And we actually generated mice uh, from this locus, um, I guess 5.1 now known as HMX3. And we found, actually Diego Hellman in my lab, found that neurons from the preotic area, not only from the ganglionic eminences, um, also migrate uh, tangentially into the neocortex and differentiate into cortical GABA or GKIMTA neurons. And a few years back, uh, uh, Alice uh, asked for the mice, I think because he has the, a sense of, you know, of, of incompletion of that kind of work. And, and, and his lab actually took these mice and characterized very, very carefully um, the specific cell types deriving from that region. And they found something that I, I, I think is quite remarkable is that a very specific uh, subtype of interneuroneogliaform cells seem to derive at least, you know, uh, a good number of them from this um, preotic region in the subpallion. And, and they, they did beautiful molecular characterization, um, molecular rec uh, mo morphological reconstruction and electrophysiological profiles, um, kind of adding to this um, um, kind of uh, uh, ongoing idea that um, cell specification happens very uh, early at the regional level with you know, cell type um, uh, precision. Now, um, uh, beyond this this type of work, one of the remaining questions, I guess, uh, in, in the field, especially in, in the cortex, because uh, uh, development is so protracted from the time that these cells are generated in the embryo around mid-gestation to the time that we can actually record from these cells and see them uh, playing kind of mature roles. Uh, there are very, you know, there are a few weeks uh, uh, in, in, in mice and, you know, uh, uh, a lot longer time in primates and, and humans. So this very protected um, uh, period of development has actually raised questions about how early these cells are actually specified, specified down to, you know, types, down to these 60 different profiles I was talking um, uh, in my introduction. Um, the kind of general model that, that derived from work from Tom Yesel, uh, the late Tom Yesel in the spinal core, uh, and, and the, you know, the model that we have adopted was the, uh, the idea that these cells are actually specified very early on, as probably as soon as they become postmitotic. And this is due to the specification of progenitor cells, again, similar to what has been proposed in the spinal core in, in other regions of the uh, of the uh, central nervous system um that that's a, that doesn't mean that you know there's a single progenitor cell for every single type of of uh, interneuron uh, we know actually that single progenitor cells can generate um different types of of interneurons but it kind of suggests that the cells get specified very early on and then over this very protected time of development they unfold a program of differentiation that is somehow predetermined for these cells to become a particular cell class now, an alternative view of this is that perhaps cells in the telencephalon, in the cortex in particular, uh, cortical interneurons are not specified down to their uh, type uh, of interneurons from very early stages, but perhaps a specification is down to only the major subclasses, subclasses that I was uh, telling you about, only maybe fast spiking or some other statin or some of the other classes, but not down to uh, kind of minute uh, details or subtypes uh, within these classes. And um, we, we've been going back and forth uh, between these two models and try to do experiments to sort out this um, a specific question. And we actually started um, quite modestly, but with a lot of um, uh, work, you know, working with just a handful of transcription factors. And this is actually work from um, uh, my very first PhD student, uh, Nuria Flames, who, uh, you know, characterized the expression of a handful of transcription factors and already so that, for example, within the ganglionic eminence, um, the progenitor pools are quite diverse, kind of similar to what you see in the spinal cord. You can imagine that, you know, progenitor cells in the dorsal uh, MG will, will generate, uh, you know, slightly different classes of, of cells that in the ventral um, uh, uh, MG. Now, uh, much more recently, um, uh, MIDA in the lab has, uh, uh, a postdoc in the lab has taken a much broader kind of uh, unbiased approach and, and apply kind of the power of single cell transcriptomic to, to explore this problem uh, from a different angle. And, you know, back in the days that he started doing these experiments, we were using fluimidine approaches. So we used um, kind of fairly dense um, uh, coverage and, you know, um, uh, in terms of, of transcriptional profile, but, you know, relatively modest amount of, of cells. And what we did in these experiments is basically used uh, um, uh, embryos to a couple of different ages and take 
um, chunks of, of uh, tissue from the ganglionic eminence, as you can see in the diagram. And we took these um, pieces of tissue very closely, you know, including the ventricular and the subventricular zone, and a bit of the mantle of the uh, uh, ganglionic eminences. And the idea there was that um, because we know that um, uh, migrating neurons, once they become post-mitotic, uh, they migrate quite quickly away from the ganglionic eminences on their way to the cortex, that in this profiling, we will basically isolate both uh, progenitor cells um, and uh, a lot of, of um, uh, uh, newborn neurons. And, and, and we used um, random force uh, uh, approaches to essentially distinguish, you know, based on the uh, expression pattern of these cells, the pools of progenitor cells from the pools of newborn neurons. And, and you just have to consider that because of the way that, that things develop in the subpallium, these are neurons that, you know, within a very few hours of being, becoming postmitotic because, you know, a few hours after that, they will have left uh, uh, the place where we took the cells. So these are really newborn neurons uh, with only a few hours on their clock. And we asked the question whether uh, we can we could recognize uh, features of mature cells in these um, early born embryonic um, uh, neurons. And, and for this, we did a number of approaches. I'm just going to show here one of them, which is essentially using canonical correlation analysis. Uh, what we did here is, uh, you know, back in uh, uh, at this time, uh, we were not using the last release uh, from uh, Allen, but uh, uh, the release that uh, that they put on this 2016 Nature Neuroscience. Uh, paper in which they already identify 23 different types of cortical interneurons. And we ask, you know, comparing the transcriptional profile of these mature interneurons, what they had in common with our newborn embryonic cells. And we brought them all together into the same kind of um, uh, dimensional reduction, as you can see in this Disney uh, 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 plot uh, here. We look essentially for common variation between our embryonic data set and the adult data set. And when you do this, um, uh, you obviously lose a lot of information because there are many, many genes that are important for distinguishing adult uh, interneurons that are not expressed in the embryo. So when we do this exercise, instead of recovering 23 subtypes of uh, mature interneurons, we only recover about 12 or so, a dozen of different types of, of interneurons. Now, we, when we brought them in the same space, you have here now all, all um, both adult uh, cells in, in colors, you know, color code, and all our embryonic neurons here in gray. And then we used, um, um, you know, as I say, canonical correlation analysis uh, followed by K nearest uh, neighborhood to ask how similar were each of these gray cells to a specific profiles of mature interneurons. The results are shown in this second graph. And, and what you can see now, color-coded are embryonic cells. So the adult cells are, have been removed. And there are two things that you can see, uh, I think, quite obviously. One is that there are many cells um, color-coded here in gray that has disappeared in the second graph because we didn't have um, sufficient information to actually relate them to any adult uh, profile. Um, I think the interesting point is that there is already a handful of cells that remain in this plot and that with some certainty um, and a statistical significance, we can actually suggest that they actually are quite heavily related to adult profiles, suggesting that even within a few hours of being born, these cells have transcriptional signatures that are related to what they eventually uh, end up expressing a few weeks later in the adult uh, cortex. Now, this is um, all well and good, and it kind of fits with this idea of very early specification down not, not just to, to subclasses levels, but down to a specific uh, uh, profiles of interneurons. But it's, it's all a bit abstract in the sense that, you know, we've been using primarily bioinformatic approaches to do this. So we, we cannot focus on some other starting cells, um, um, these three pool of, uh, you know, blue cells that we could distinguish in these early uh, embryonic profiles and, and try to relate that to something more tangible, more, uh, I guess, biologically relevant. And this turns to be the uh, postdoc work of uh, Lynette Lin, who was you know, another postdoc in our laboratory and was actually interested in looking at some other starting cells uh, from a slightly different perspective. He was interested in looking at how these cells migrate into the cortex and, you know, follow the observation that when these cells migrating in the embryo uh, reach the cortex, they don't just go randomly, but they tend to use two main routes. Um, there are some cells that migrate through the marginal zone and some other cells that actually tend to migrate deep with, you know, small smaller population working, you know, making their way through the subplate.
Um, so essentially what Lynette wanted to know is whether these uh, somatostatin cells were kind of randomly allocated to these um, uh, roots or whether they actually uh, was any linkage between um, the cell type that you know these cells were going to become and the root of migration that they were going to use. And I guess if our hypothesis is that these cells are early, um, you know, uh, specified very early in, in the embryo, you know, even before they start moving into the cortex, we could see some correlation between cell types and migratory routes. So what Lynette did is, is uh, simple to describe, very difficult to do kind of experiments. He did one flat preparation, the one that you would normally use uh, in adult cortex to get tangential sections through the somatosensory viral cortex, for example, but she did this in the embryo and got um, horizontal slices. And you know, in, in this method, he could separate um, somatostatin cells using this reporter line and uh, uh, from you know, somatostatin pre-cells. Somatostatin cells going through the marginal zone, then discard two or three slices and collect the cells, migrate them to the subventricular zone, use facts to isolate the cells, and then bulk RNA sequencing to isolate um, the, in this case, TD tomato cells. And then she looked at differential express genes, and what she found one is that indeed the cells uh, migrating through the marginal zone and subventricular zone express, um, um, you, know, uh, you know, most of the genes that they express are common, but there's a handful of genes. And in this case, for example, I'm highlighting here genes that are um, uh, much more highly expressed in the marginal zone population compared to the subventricular zone population. Um, in this case, about a two dozens uh, of genes, and you have a couple of examples in these in situ. So even though these are very early born, I mean, very early um, uh, in the embryo, these cells are migrating into the cortex. Um, these data suggest that they already have um, uh, gene expression profiles that you know, can help you to distinguish them uh, quite nicely. So what uh, Lynette did uh, at that point is actually look at the genes uh, that are expressed preferentially in marginal zone uh, cells or somatostatin cells migrating through the marginal zone better and compare that to uh, the profile of adult somatostatin interneurons. And again, um, back in the day, we were using the 16 release, uh, uh, the 2016 release of of Allen and in which they already distinguished about six, six subtypes of somatostatin cells. And what you can see, even though, I mean, this is a very noisy graph because we're only looking at 24 genes, but uh, what you can immediately see is that, for example, total cells, which are actually not interneurons, but long range uh, projection somatostatin cells, and I'll go back to them uh, later in my talk, uh, do not express any of them. But even within the rest of these, you can actually kind of nicely see um, that they, there's, you know, a center profile here um, uh, that express many of the genes. And Quite nicely, actually, these actually match the somatostatin one, two, and three groups that I just described through the uh, single cell data. And this uh, somatostatin two profile actually fits with what in the adult we recognize as Martinotti cells, uh, which led us to hypothesize that perhaps indeed, you know, cell specification is happening very early, not in an abstract way, but actually identifying a specific uh, type of somatostatin neurons. And the hypothesis in this case is that Martinotti cells were preferentially using the marginal zone route of migration to get into the cortex. So Lynette designed experiments to actually test started this, this hypothesis. And first, what she did is a control experiment in which she used some of the statin cre uh, uh, mice uh, to only capture cells that eventually turn on some of the statin. And what she did is inject retroviruses into the lateral ventricle of the telencephalon at this stage 14.5, focusing uh, essentially on late born upper layer interneurons. By doing this experiment, what, what she was doing is essentially random labeling progenitor cells in the, in this, you know, everywhere in the telencephalon indeed, but she was only gonna be able to visualize those that eventually led to the uh, uh, somatostatin uh, neuron expressing pre and therefore recombining this um, uh, flux dependent TD tomato reporter. So the expectation here, because you're labeling random progenitors is that you will recover everything that is being produced in the subpallion and independently of the root of migration. So both marginal zone and subventricular zone migrating cells. Once you did this experiment, see recover what you actually see in the adult, that um, about 60% of the neurons that you recover in layer two, three are Martinotti cells, and 40% are actually non-Martinotti cells. And you know, for the in the context of this audience and you know for the purpose of the of the talk, the only thing that you need to know to distinguish these two cells is that Martinotti cells 
um, have part of the axon invading layer one, ramifying very profusely in uh, layer one, whereas non-Martinotti cells, even though sometimes they get very close to layer one, they never have this very profuse axon in uh, layer one. And, and again, I'm showing you now data for layer two, three, but you know, there are plenty of these cells also in deeper layers of the, of the cortex. Now, um, Lynette did then a key experiment, which is, you know, develop a method in which instead of labeling randomly cells that could migrate through both places, um, adapt kind of a, uh, uh, a letter operation protocol to essentially target the same plasmid now into the PL surface. And in a very inefficient, uh, but, you know, uh, workable protocol, uh, electroporate only the surface of the, uh, of the cortex. You will normally um, have heard about in utero electroporation, you know, in which you introduce uh, DNA in ventricular zone cells, but this is kind of the opposite, kind of outside in uh, approach to electroporation. So you will only target cells in the marginal uh, zone. And because uh, this is done in a somatostatin pre, in a, in a flux dependent uh, manner, you will only label cells again that will turn on somatostatin in that context. And I'm not going to show you uh, any uh, uh, control for the sake of of time and this is actually published uh, uh, work, but um, this is only uh, uh, targeting cells migrating through marginal zone. You don't reach anybody on the cortical plate or any uh, anywhere deeper than that. So when she did this experiment, she recovered something that was quite uh, uh, reassuring. Uh, but by targeting only the marginal zone, she, you know, 95% of the somatostatin cells recovered were actually marking out these cells. Um, at this stage, most, most in layer two, three, but also uh, some of them is still going into uh, deep layers. So that actually suggests that the cells that migrate uh, through the marginal zone, they come from the somatostatin lineage, are prime, are afraid to be um, or to become eventually Martinotti uh, cells, which, you know, considering this split um, uh, in the normal population, that actually tends to suggest that, that most of the other cells, the non-Martinotti cells, are actually using the deep root to migrate into the cortex. Now, with these sun experiments to, to um, try to further link migration with, um, with the profile of the cell, and the idea here was to identify factors that, that could somehow disrupt the normal migration of somatostatin cells. And one of these factors is one of the transcription factors that we saw differentially expressed in marginal zone uh, cells, MAF-B. Uh, and as you can see, even though it's a fairly mild uh, phenotype, uh, when you quantify the fraction of somatostatin cells that migrate through the marginal zone, you see about you know, one third or so decrease in the number of cells that normally go through the marginal zone. So we could ask in these conditions, um, do we see, you know, um, uh, any problem with Martinotti cells specifically? Right, so here um, what we did is the reverse order in the experiments. Uh, so first, uh, using MAF-B uh, conditional knockout, we electroporate only cells uh, migrating through the marginal zone. And, you know, the reasoning behind this experiment is that this would allow to uh, distinguish whether MAF-B was very important for making uh, somatostatin cell, uh, sorry, Martinotti cell, or whether MAV was primarily important for directing the migration of these cells, and we could then evaluate how good this effect um, um, on the uh, final fate of this uh, particular class of cells. So when she did these experiments, and essentially she's only targeting cells migrating through the marginal zone, and removing, you know, uh, with the conditional approach, removing essentially uh, uh, MAF, uh, MAF B from there. What C recovered was fairly normal looking um, uh, Martinotti cells, as you can see in, those, in these two pictures. And we did a lot of quantifications. So removing MAF B, um, if, if the migration was normal, and as I saw you in the previous slide, you know, most of the cells actually still managed to migrate to the right place, uh, did not result in any change in the morphology or any other properties of these Martinotti cells. However, when we did the experiment uh, with, you know, using a completely random uh, approach, so, you know, basically labeling progenitors, and as I told you before, this will essentially label both cells that will migrate to the marginal zone, but also cells migrating to the superventricular zone. We begin to find we're looking um, on Martinotti cells, and what you see, for example, in this slide, is, is these are cells that, by any other means, you know, marker electrophysiology, um, anything that you could uh, count of are actually Martinotti cells, but they actually fail to develop a proper, you know, arborization uh, in layer one as compared to the controls. 
So that suggests that if uh, the cells are actually faded to migrate, uh, sorry, are faded to become marginal of these cells, but if they fail to migrate to the right route, so the route that we were intended, in this case, the marginal zone, they actually to fail to develop a full profile of marginal of these cells. Again, let me emphasize that by any other means that we can look at these cells, they are marginal of these cells, they express everything they have to express, but they just fail to develop this very prominent feature of marginal of these cells, which is the action in layer one. And we think we understand why that's actually happening. And we did um, uh, understood this by looking, for example, at um, the migration of these cells as they actually enter the cortical plate. And I'm going to show you just uh, this video. So uh, just imagine that the cells are migrating tangentially in this direction. And at, at a given time, they will dive down into the cortical plate to take residence in what will become layer two, three. And most cells you know, will migrate with a leading process and a trailing process, and they will move a little bit like a snail, um, but you know, advancing the leading process and then retracting the trailing process and so on. But you can see in uh, these cells, you know, target precisely but because they're migrating through the, uh, through the marginals. And what you will see in this uh, movie is that these prospective marking of these cells do something quite different. They actually migrate down, as you can see, following these particular cells. But I hope you can appreciate that instead of retracting the, the trailing process, they actually left their trailing process within the marginal zone. So they migrate tangentially, turn 90 degrees, dive down into the cortical plate. And as they do so, uh, in very different from other migrating cells, they leave this very long trailing process behind. And when Lynette actually tried to characterize this process, and for example, you can use this kinesin, which is a label of naxin axons uh, in, in neurons, you can actually see that this trailing process left behind is very beautifully labeled with this kinesin, suggesting that when these cells migrate down, the leading process is guiding their migration, but what they left behind is actually their axon. It's the very same axon that then we will see profusely ramifying in the marginal zone. So what we think it's, it's happening is that these cells are afraid to migrate through the marginal zone. They're afraid to become marginal these cells. And part of unfolding that program, uh, prog uh, program requires moving through the marginal zone and then diving down while leaving the axon behind. And uh, I'm happy to speculate about this in the questions, but we think that uh, there is an appropriate time uh, for these cells to, to put an action here and that probably later on when a lot more myelin and other actions are it's a lot more complicated for the cells to actually put an action there so they have optimized the route of migration to actually leave their action behind very similar to what um you know, and the, this was described by pascal Raki 40 years ago what granular cells um, do in, in the cerebellum when they move from the internal granular cell layer past Purkinje cells into their final uh, location. In that case, leaving parallel fibers um, behind. Right, so um, this is just to kind of uh, summarize what, what I told you in, in this second part, in, in, in the sense that at least by the time that these cells get into the cortex, we are fairly um, uh, convinced that they actually know what they're going to become. And that in this particular case, for example, Martinotti. Uh, type of similar satin cells tend to migrate from the marginal zone as part of unfolding their program, whereas the other cells tend to take a, a, a deeper route. Um, now, I, I saw you at, at the beginning, you know, these three uh, types of similar statin cells. Now, the question is, you know, when you, you know, every time that you go back to a new island release, there are more and more types of cells. And, you know, in the last 18, 2018 release, there are up to 21 uh, transcription are different types of somatostatin uh, cells. Um, you have here on the very left, the number one, these are long range uh, projection neurons, but even within the Martinotti and non Martinotti are a lot more profiles. So we know that, that it's not just subclasses that are specified. We now think that even types of somatostatins are actually uh, specified very early. Um, what about more granularity? Can we start to see many of these down uh, to the level of uh, specific types as early as in the embryo? So to follow on this, uh, both uh, uh, Mira and uh, Lynette has collaborated in a project with the help of Joe Fisher um, um, to extend this analysis. And now we have turned into using 10x genomics. And what we're doing is essentially capturing these same somatostatin cells directly from the cortex, all of them, and then doing single cell transcriptomics, um, to, trying to build a timeline of this um, uh, population of cells to see how early we can start distinguishing 
not just types, you know, down to very you know specific subtypes in the cortex. So we have you know thousands of cells now at a 16.5, p1, and p5. And and what we essentially have done is is use CIRAD to integrate all these data. And you know when you bring it all together, it looks like this. Um, we have a bit more. Uh, e 16.5 cells that are easier to capture a good quality than the postnatal cells. But I, I hope you can appreciate that you have very good coverage around all these uh, now UMAP space uh, uh, representing all three ages, which led us to, to, to think that we are actually starting to see diversity that is not just developmental stage, but actually identifying uh, cell types. And if you do actually completely unbiased uh, clustering uh, uh, here, you come up with some picture that is emerging that is quite nice. Uh, with this amount of cells, it very easily can distinguish long-range projection cells, this total population of cells, non-Martinotti cells and Martinotti cells. But you know, I hope you can appreciate the colors. Every, every one of these cloud is actually now um, uh, uh, containing different subtypes. And we have begun to identify differential express genes that as early as you know embryonic and early postnatal stages allow us to distinguish these cell populations. And you know, at, at the moment we can distinguish about 14 uh, groups with you know there are not as many as 21, but it's I think quite remarkable considering how early we are looking at the, these cells. And again, very similar to what I said for the adult cells. Uh, maybe not all of these actually represent a specific cell type. Some of them may actually represent a state, uh, you know, looking at it from a developmental perspective. Um, we're still working on that, but we think that many of these actually represent a much quite well a specific adult types in, in, in the adult uh, mature uh, cortex. Um, so kind of emphasizing this idea that it, it, it seems to come to down to, you know, very minute specification um, um, very early on down to the subtype um, at these very earlier stages. Um, the nice thing about this is that it, it is allowing us not only to find correlation with the adult interneurons, but actually um, uh, starting to discover things that, that were completely unexpected. And uh, let me just point out to you know one of the things that we're uh, exploring. And this is, uh, these brands here, as I told you, are long range projection neurons. Uh, they are characterized by the expression of total. And as you can see, we have identified already genes that uh, actually can distinguish two, at least two main, perhaps even more subtypes of long range projection neurons as early as uh, early postnatal stages. And, and you can see that, you know, they're very readily uh, uh, distinguishable. And it's interesting because um, uh, we know that these long-range projection neurons have different patterns of projection. Some only project intracortically, some others project, for example, to the striatum. So we're trying to now correlate these findings, these different subtypes that we've seen emerge very early uh, in development and try to see whether they actually correlate with, for example, distant patterns of projections for these cells. Right, let me close the, uh, this uh, part of my talk by kind of reinforcing this idea that I think uh, you know, we have fairly convincing evidence suggesting that this model of early cell type specification actually happens in the cortex, even though it, it may actually take weeks uh, in some cases for these cells to develop into a future, you know, mature state um, later on. Now, although this is true, I think that, you know, the data that I showed you about the migration of Martinotti cells also point out to the idea that, that you also require this context dependency. Uh, uh, for these cells to eventually develop into what we recognize as, as mature cells. So for Martinotti cells, my view is that they are actually specified very early on to become Martinotti cells, that part of that program uh, requires moving through a particular migratory route, in this case, the marginal zone. And only if you do that, if you achieve that, that transitory state of moving to the right place, then you develop uh, this, this, this axon in, in layer one um, and that you can uh, use to recognize Martinotti cells. Otherwise, the cells will not develop as um, uh, normally as they would do uh, otherwise. So these context-dependent programs are important. Um, uh, it's not only about how you start, but also how you travel, uh, in this case, uh, to the core. Right, for the, I think let's, um, 10, 15 minutes of my talk and let's switch gears. Before that, let me just tell you, um, uh, on closing this chapter, you know, where we're heading, we're not only expanding our work in, in mouse, 
on uh, cell specification, but we're beginning to do experiments in human embryos, uh, thanks to the human uh, developmental biology resource here uh, in the UK. And um, work from the island and also uh, work uh, in collaboration with uh, Nana Sestan and Yell has, you know, uh, we, we have seen that, you know, maybe the types uh, of cortical interneurons in rodents and humans are not so different. Uh, uh, but one of the things that we see clearly as, as a difference, and that alludes to uh, the numbers that I referred to at the beginning of my talk is that the relative proportions of the different uh, cell types are different. So we're beginning to, uh, you know, to profile the galvanic eminences in a dynamic way to try to understand why the human galvanic eminence has produced uh, interneurons at different proportions that um, uh, they do in the rodent uh, uh, case. All right, let me change gears and, and let me kind of give you the the other side of the coin of what I've been telling you about. Uh, everything that I told you so far is about early specification, um, transcription factors, and, and you know, very early determinants. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about kind of the other side of the equation, how activity actually influence the function and, and, and the identity of, of the cell in a more state-dependent kind of manner as opposed to a cell identity type of manner. And this actually derived from um, work uh, uh, we've been doing in the lab for a number of years now, and, and it started with um, the observation that uh, if you focus, for example, on upper layer PV fast spiking basket cells, that I highlighted um, uh, here, um, they actually come in two um, main flavors, and, and Natalie actually explored this in quite some detail, but you know, many other people have looked at these cells um, before. Um, so you can find two type of uh, basket fast spiking cells. You have the classical fast spiking cells, very fast responding, kind of feed forward inhibitory cells that you very frequently find in layer four. Um, and you have another population that you know uh, uh, we and others uh, uh, call delay fast spiking cells that have a little bit of uh, of more ability to uh, to filter out, I guess, uh, uh, inputs and you know can delay responses um, um, uh, to to some extent. And uh, these are actually intermingled in the uh, uh, layer two, three of the cortex. There's a little bit of a gradient uh, between layer two and three, but to some extent they are um, intermingled among each other. And Natalie found something quite interesting uh, for us is that she identified a single transcription factor, ERA1, uh, also known as uh, 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 ETP1 uh, transcription factor, uh, an ETS transcription factor that is preferentially expressed in these delay fast spiking um, uh, interneurons. And uh, she also went and saw that this uh, transcription factor is actually important for these delay properties in, in this fast spiking population, because for example, uh, it is able to bind and, and promote the expression of uh, potassium channels like KB1.1, which is part of the machinery that you require uh, to allow these uh, delay responses. Now, in addition to showing that ERA1 is actually uh, fundamental for these properties, its intrinsic properties to emerge in these cells, um, one uh, very interesting observation that Natalie made actually is that you can sort out these cells in delay and not delay cells based on, on, on their properties and the expression of ERA1. But if you plug them in a graph, um, what you see is, is more of a continuum of cells uh, going from very low expressing uh, cells, low ERA1 expressing cells that delay very little uh, to the first spike, and all the way to cells with you know high you know levels of ERA1 expression that actually delay a lot um, when you see them. So you could you know you could try to artificially split these populations of cells, but to a large extent they seem to form um, uh, kind of a continuum. And, and so you actually wanted to test this and, and to see to what extent changes in network properties in the cortex would actually impact um, uh, the intrinsic properties of this uh, particular population of cells. Um, what she did is, is a number of uh, relatively crude experiments. But for example, she looked at motor learning using the rotor rod. And what's, when she did these experiments, uh, what she found is that you can actually change the relative proportion of delay and non-delay fast spiking cells uh, in the cortex. Total number of PV basket cells in layer two, three does not change, but the relative proportion changes. So in these learning experiments, you increase the population of fast spiking cells. 
If, uh, on, on the contrary, what you do is experiments, and this is using uterine interpretation, in which you decrease the activity of pyramidal cells in layer two, three, you achieve quite the opposite. You kind of move, um, you know, the proportion of cells to actually delay, increase um, in these conditions. So you can actually shift the uh, properties of these cells and make them more or less uh, uh, delayed, but just actually playing with activity uh, in uh, in the neocortex in a non-cell autonomous kind of um, kind of manner, so that actually suggests that you know opposed to what I told you at, you know, at the beginning in, in terms of cell specification, there's a number of properties um, that are a lot more fluid and they probably reflect states in which these cells participate in and or activity perhaps in learning and in recall of a specific memories in, in, in certain secrets. Um, and cells can maybe oscillate in some of this uh, uh, state uh, to adapt to, uh, to the conditions that are ongoing in a particular piece of the cortex. Now, let me finish um, by showing you some uh, new data on, on kind of this very same uh, topic. And, uh, you know, moving towards not, not understanding how a network activity may actually modulate PV properties, but you know how single cells, single PV cells, uh, will cell autonomously uh, adapt to changes in their own activity, and you know somehow homeostatic plasticity, you know, from a cell autonomous kind of way. And a lot of these experiments have been done um, before with in vitro manipulations, uh, but uh, Martin in the lab has taken a, a kind of in vivo approach to manipulate. Um, and these cells, and then you know, use recordings to assess the homeostatic plasticity in, in these cells. I'm going to share a couple of slides of his um, ongoing work. Um, so instead of like modifying the entire network here, what we wanted to do is just to change the activity of a few PV basket cells. And for this, what Martin did is to uh, use threads and you know, conditionally express that flux dependent threads in PV Cree animals. In get the virus very early on, you know that PV will take a while to actually um, get expressed and eventually recombine this. But you know, he, we wait for eight weeks or so before adding either vehicle or CNO to activate these uh, uh, fast spiking cells. And he does this protocol for a couple of days, um, and then after that, he sacrifices the animal and prepares lysis and go and record from these PV uh, cells and. Um, both the scheme and the um, uh, images here are, are meant to show that we are actually on um, um, very sparse labeling. So we are only targeting, due to the concentration of the virus, very sparse PV cells within the entire slide. So most PV cells are not changing. So we don't anticipate actually network effects. And you know, uh, Martin has done a lot of controls to actually show that that's the case. That the changes that we're seeing are cell autonomous. And you can see the threads are working. You know, in a different number of different ways. This is a nice way of looking at at it. You can look at CFOS and early immediately, and you can see that all these cells have very high level of C uh, CFOS when you uh, activate the uh, uh, the threads. So so the cells, you know, are are you know, have increased the suitability. And the question is, what did they do? You know, after a couple of days of increased uh, suitability, what happened to these cells? So uh, Martin prepares lysis and record from some of these cells and then look at excitatory inputs and inhibitory inputs to these cells, because you could imagine that to adapt to this uh, increased suitability, the cells could do a number of things. They could, for example, decrease their excitatory inputs. And as you can see in this graph, that doesn't happen. So there's no change in the excitatory drive uh, to these uh, cells. However, um, the other way that it could do to adapt to this increased stability is to increase uh, the number of inhibitory inputs. And as you can see, this is what they do. Within these two days, um, very rapidly, um, there's, you know, there's a prominent increase in the inhibition um, coming into these cells, which we think is largely driven by increased number of synapses um, targeting these PV cells. Now, this increase in inputs, increase in synapses that happen quite rapidly after you modify the uh, suitability of, of, of you know, sparse PV cells could be coming from uh, many sources. It could actually be a general increase in inhibition to these cells, or it could actually be down to a, in a specific population of interneurons that is taking control of this homeostatic synaptic plasticity. Um, so Martin devised a set of complicated but very clever experiments to test this, and essentially what he wanted to do is kind of a bulk uh, response experiments using uh, kind of an autogenetic approach. And let me take you through the uh, 
a slide because it's uh, you know the method is is straightforward, but uh, I need to take take you through it uh, to uh, for you to understand. So what we're generating is um, animals in which um, uh, essentially all animals will have uh, a, an allele of PV flip. So it will be expressing flip from the PV locus. So all the infected cells um, uh, um, uh, with the virus will be expressing flip. And now instead of using a cre dependent virus, we are using a flip dependent virus uh, to express our threat. Um, so essentially the same experiment that before, but now we have moved to the flip side of things uh, to uh, express the uh, uh, the uh, threats, and we're doing this because we are now using CRE to drive tenetiroxin, and we we have three different set of experiments uh, in this configuration. The first one, what we're doing is expressing tenetiroxin from other PV cells. In the second, we will be um, uh, exciting you know PV cells, but we will be um, uh, expressing tenetiroxin from some other statin cells, and the same one for um, BIP cells here. So in all configurations we will be affecting primarily uh, the PV cells, but then we kind of stimulate the different population of interneurons and see whether this increase in, in inhibition that we see in the previous experiments is actually coming from a specific population of cells. And again, you know, we, we provide vehicle or CNO um, in this window um, uh, a couple of days and then prepare slices and record. And when we record now, what we do is a bulk stimulation using LED um, a stimulation of terminal ops in these uh, experiments. And I'm going to skip all the controls uh, that you will want to see to, to make sure that these experiments are working to show you just the results. And the results is that um, when you modify PV cells, the inhibition that they see uh, increasing, that the, the compensatory inhibition is actually coming from other PV cells, as you can see. Um, as specifically in this experiment. When you do the same experiments from the other populations, and these data are preliminary, we still need to increase the numbers, but you know, again, recording from PV cells, but now uh, looking at the input from the starting cells, looking at the inputs from BIP interneurons, you see no changes in, in those uh, uh, inputs. So that actually suggests that the homeostatic response in these PV cells is actually mediated by recruiting an increased number of, of synapses from other uh, PV cells in the network. Okay, uh, uh, just uh, you know, going forward, you know, in this last set of experiments, I basically told you that you know we can modulate uh, PV cells when you know making um, network changes or by directly affecting the suitability of, of these cells, and we know that actually leads to um, very specific changes in in the number of synapses. That's the way that these cells, for example, in this particular set of experiments, are adapting to uh, these changes. What we want to know now is how is this achieved? You know, what are the molecular mechanisms that are driving this homeostatic increase in the inputs from other uh, PV cells specifically? And for this, Martin has designed a kind of V-trap um, uh, experiment. I'm not going to take you through the details, but the idea is to be able to isolate these PV cells once they have actually um, been modified and leading to the increase in PV interneurons, um, and ideally to identify what are the molecular gene expression mechanisms by looking at you know, translation of genes that have been specifically induced by the manipulation that actually are responsible for the change in number of synapses in this population of interneurons. Eventually use this to also understand what is the role of these PV cells um, uh, and their plasticity uh, specifically during uh, learning. All right. Um, that's all for me. Um, let me uh, finish by, you know, reminding the people that actually have done everything that I uh, discussed today. I start by talking about um, uh, Dami's uh, uh, work. He is uh, literally leaving tomorrow to Beijing to start his own uh, lab. He should have left uh, a few months uh, back, but, back, but you know, due to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, he has remained with us a, a, a bit longer, which I'm really grateful because he has done a lot of stuff uh, since then. Um, I'll talk to you about Martin Oti migration with uh, a word from uh, Lynette, who is now a group leader at uh, BIB in uh, Leuven. And both collectively, um, with the help of Joe Fischer, has been doing this late work on some other studying subtitle specification. Um, final bit, uh, work from Natalie um, on uh, PV delay and non-delay cells. Natalie is now group leader in Canberra, also uh, running her own very successful group. The last piece of unpublished work is uh, from Marta and Selton, uh, uh, postdoc uh, in the lab. These are our funding uh, uh, sources, and this is uh, beautiful London at night where we 
live and work. And I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. All right, Oscar, this is the awkward mom moment when I'm the only one audibly clapping. But um, if you look on the right of the screen, usually there tends to be some uh, emoticons of, of hands clapping. Thank you very much for, for sharing these, these data, including an unpublished work with us. Let me close that for you. Thank you. Uh, voila, yes, yeah, some claps are coming there on, on the right. OK, Thanks. so now has come the time uh, for the Q&As. You're welcome to type in your questions or to vote for questions um, below there. Voting doesn't mean that you um, that you like the question, but it means that you have some relationship to it. So I'll start uh, with the, the first question there, Fernando Garcia, which has the following question. To what extent do you think uh, the migratory decision of traveling through either the MZ or the subventricular zone is affected or induced by cortical cues? Um, for example, RGCs, cortical fugal axons, cortical plate cues, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, um, well, I mean, uh, undoubtedly, they have to be responding to cues provided by uh, uh, cells in the cortex or axons coming into the cortex. Um, um, I don't think we have figured out that yet. I mean, this is not something that we are um, actively uh, uh, pursuing. But you know, I imagine, and you know, this is something that we, as I said, we haven't followed up. Some of the genes that we see expressed very specifically, for example, in the cells in the marginal zone, um, are actually likely to be uh, interactors of some of these uh, uh, cues. And there's a few actually additional molecules that we see in that list that very specifically could help us to understand why they migrate through that uh, route. Um, one thing that's interesting is that with these SAN experiments, and these were not trivial experiments to do, and we couldn't do it in vivo, which would have been the right, right thing to do. But even, uh, I think the cells are really trying to do that. And if you recover them from the cortex and you, in a slice, you put them back into the learning eminences and you ask them to migrate again, they actually go back essentially to the route that they choose um, um, before. So they are really prying and they keep kind of responding to the same uh, uh, guidance cues. It's just that, you know, we haven't actually um, identified those, uh, those uh, uh, cues uh, at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Philippe Abbe, interneurons are switching between the streams. Is the coupling between migra migration route and identity unfolding time dependent? In other words, um, staying longer in the marginal zone would drive a given identity, for example, for Martinotti cells. Yes. I mean, this is something that we have not, uh, I think, fully explored. And, and I think it's it's correct to actually uh, point that out that is movement across uh, uh, streams. One of the things that when we look at this carefully, it, one of the things that we notice is that the, this primarily movement from the subventricular zone into the marginal zone. Um, when when you look very carefully from the marginal zone, it's very rare to see a cell going all the way down. And most of the cells that actually dive down stay within the cortical uh, plate. But there might be some more precise uh, uh, timing correlations between you know the time that they spent in a particular location and, and uh, their fate. Um, again, I will emphasize that I think that even though the migration is very important for the actual unfolding of the, of the um, uh, whole program of, of maturation of the cells, we don't think that it's crucial for their specification. You can actually um, uh, take progenitors and transplant it into the postnatal cortex and they will develop as Martinotti cells, you know, funny enough, if you transplant it into the marginals, in, into the cortex postnatally, and this is, for example, experiments that Arturo Arbery and others have done, for example, in the context of looking at uh, cortical plasticity and, you know, reopening of critical periods, the cells become really very functional. But, you know, one thing that we have looked at very carefully, and um, and it is quite nice, is that Martinotti cells, they express everything they have to express, they seem to behave everything in the way that they should uh, behave, they don't have an action in layer one. So if you transplant them and skip migration, they they do develop, they acquire the fate they are supposed to be acquiring, but they have a very poorly developed action in layer one. So yes. that kind of re-emphasize the idea that, that you cannot just skip entirely the migration, that even though you're fated, uh, part of uh, you know, developing properly requires these intermediate steps. Hmm. Interesting. 
Um, there is an overlapping uh, origin of uh, NG2 cells, OPCs, and interneurons during development. Do you think that those glial cells derived from the ganglionic eminences could influence the identity of interneurons? I guess it relates to a question I would also have, like what's your vision on how different subtypes of interneurons might interact with others? There's stuff from uh, Law and Guillen's labs in particular, but also others. Um, how, what weight do you put on that? Yes. Um, what would be my answer to that question? I guess that I, I guess that everything is. I think the difficulty of, of these experiments is that every time we look at a single aspect of the development of these cells, we are kind of doing mm. all or nothing experiments, right? So we get. Uh, I'm not saying that we are only doing gain of function experiments, but to some extent, the way we are approaching it. Um, we can, I think we can be quite sure that they actually play a role. It's very difficult to know in vivo what is the actual contribution of everything that we're looking at. I'm not saying just the, the early genetic factors, but also actually the interaction with the other, with the other uh, uh, populations. My feeling is that uh, these cells have to remain plastic to some extent to compensate for possible problems along the way. And I would imagine that um, post-mitotic feedback from other cells is one way of actually making sure that some problems might actually be corrected on on your way and you know Lorraine uh, work for example uh it's illustrative in that context and i would imagine that you know a lot more of that would be coming on you know including interactions with glial cells i think at this point i don't i don't think we have the right experiment to really know um you know what you know to what extent you know what is the relevance of each one of these um possible mechanisms individually i guess that's so, so what's the level of evidence for cell cell interactions like it would could there be a mechanism similar to fasciculation for axons where a subset of the axons would would be really instructed and the other ones would just passively follow yes i mean i think i think for migration and uh, um, you know, we have moved away from, from looking at migration very carefully in the last few years, but we have plenty of evidence that these cells migrating to the cortex interact with each other massively. They they touch each other, they remain in contact, and there's good evidence that, that these interactions are absolutely meaningful. Um, to what extent they're instructive from a safe, uh, uh, you know, from a self-fate perspective manner, uh, I think that's I think that's a difficult uh, uh, question to answer, uh, I guess, appropriately. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I will be open to uh, to look at this. At the end of the day, you probably have uh, a balance in between populations that you know that is determined at different points at the time of birth, at the time of you know migration, and obviously you, you end up having this massive period of programmed cell death that also contributes to probably uh, rebalance things that you know may have gone the wrong way in, in particular mm -hmm. uh, uh, types. Okay, thank you. A question from Guy Bouvier. Does this mutation, I'm not, not sure which one Guy is referring to, but I'll, I'll finish the sentence. Does this mutation also affect L5MC development? Uh, does this layer 2,3MC conserve the same connectivity? <laughs> There's a lot of abbreviations there. Um, maybe I'll get back to that one later, or Guy, if you want to rephrase it for, for me. So sorry about that. I'll go to the next one. Do you see any difference across cortical regions? For example, uh, Scalia, Stolias, Nature 2019 showed that V1 has most uh, somatostatin positive cells, but S1 is, is different. So area, um, intra-area differences. Yes, um, we are just beginning to explore uh, that. And I, I guess, I think it's a very interesting uh, question also in, in, in relation to this last observation about somatostatin cells also maybe even um acquiring their morphology in different ways in different uh um uh, cortical areas and it kind of reminds me a little bit of of uh, don't for example to look at uh escalate uh cells you know compared to pyramidal cells and to what extent they are similar but maybe uh stellate cells just uh, uh retract the, their apical dendrite and i think for not the non marking of these cells, and this is very early days in the analysis that we're doing, we might actually uh, find evidence for maybe uh, mixed profiles. So uh, let me let me explain this uh, properly. We think that some of these cells very clearly adopt their final morphology because they're earlier specified as Martinotti and non-Martinotti cells. 
Um, and that probably is linked to what I described for the migration. But there might actually be some uh, cells acquiring non Martinotti morphology that may initially be primed to be Martinotti cells. And then they may undergo a secondary modification by eventually removing their layer one axon uh, and, and you know, becoming kind of non Martinotti looking kind of cells. And there are some profiles on, on the transcriptome that actually look like uh, halfway in between. Uh, you know, proper Martinotti cells, kind of very clearly defined Martinotti cells and non Martinotti cells. So there might be some room for um, an, an spectrum of cells, not all of which maybe are arising from the same kind of mechanism of early specification. Maybe some of them um, um, reach the same place, the same kind of transcriptomic uh, space uh, from a detour, and they actually may actually derive, you know, uh, secondarily from. Uh, uh, a profile that looks more like a Martinotti cell early on, even though eventually they may get rid of the axon, for example, and function more like a non Martinotti cell. Okay, all right, interesting. Uh, we have a question from Shuba Tolle, um, spiritual question almost. Hi, Oscar, wonderful talk. I have a broad question. How, how do you think human interneurons know, quote unquote, know? to yeah. cover a bigger cortex in the embryos? Might there be a density tiling sensitivity in the migrating streams? Yes, um, I think you could actually use the same, you, you can pose the same question even for the mouse embryo, how they manage to actually cover up the entire, um, the entire uh, uh, cortex uh, uh, in the uh, mouse embryo. In the human embryo, I mean, what we've seen is that the amount of cells that are being produced in the ganglionic eminences, and it's very you know, earlier work from John Rubinstein and, and Arnold Christine, they have a couple of beautiful papers on, on, on this. Um, um, it's, it's just a remarkable number of cells. It's a huge amount of cells being produced. Um, we, we look at tiling uh, for a number of years, and, and the, diff the question was so difficult to address uh, in vivo for interneurons that so many of them moving in all directions in 3D that we actually end up defaulting to Cajal Retsu cells, which were easier to, to study in a 2D kind of system. And, and we mm -hmm. did indeed found evidence of, of piling mechanism. I, I, would have been, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if something similar doesn't happen in the in the uh, in the case of the uh, of the interneurons, that there's some some sort of tiling mechanism that that contributes to the deployment of of the cells in different regions of the cortex, and we see some early evidence suggesting that deployment is not completely homogeneous for all cell types across all cortical regions. So, um, I think there are interesting mechanisms at, at play there. Again, you know, it's it's not a, a trivial question to answer, especially in vivo. Yeah. Maybe one last uh, broad uh, question relating to disease. So in the context of uh, epilepsy, would you ex what would you expect the effects, what is known or what would the effects be on uh, parvabine cells identity or plasticity? Or more generally, um, what do you think um, is the contribution of interneurons to the pathogenesis of the disease? Well, I guess that there's plenty of evidence that suggesting that interneurons are involved in this, in this context. I guess that the question comes a little bit on, on the reverse to what extent um, epilepsy, I guess, that may absolutely lead to maladaptations of, of PV cells because it will probably uh, drive uh, 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 or, or tap on the mechanisms of normal plasticity of these cells and drive them uh, in, in, or lock them maybe in, in, in a permanent state. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the the one very speculative idea around this is, you know, a uh, word from Pico Caroni and others have shown that, uh, you know, PB basket cells in particular in the hippocampus and maybe in other cortical regions, um, they may, you know, they have this oscillatory uh, 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 state, you know, they define as high and low PB. I think that this might be not exactly the same that I was describing with delay and non delay, but I think it's on the same. Um, on the same uh, spectrum of changes that actually demonstrate this plasticity of PV cells, we essentially adapt to changes in the network. And as they propose in their work, it's probably required to facilitate, the, for example, the formation of new memories. Um, and then eventually they transition to another state that will facilitate the recalling of some of these um, assemblies of neurons. So you would imagine that, for example, in conditions like uh, epilepsy, uh, if you actually drive uh, this PV plasticity and you lock it into a particular state and, and because of the recurrent activity, you don't allow this um, 
um, uh, tuning of, of PV cells that they may actually compromise the ability of these cells to um, allow cognitive processing to happen. And, and you know, maybe that is one you know, very speculative way of, of, of linking uh, cognitive uh, dysfunction, cognitive problems in some cases of, of uh, epilepsy. So it would be actually interesting to, to look at it uh, uh, directly on, on, on human tissue. And, and this is, you know, my prediction is that perhaps uh, uh, these um, abnormal epileptic uh, processes are actually driving uh, 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 cells into a singular state and then preventing this plasticity, which I assume is actually quite normal in, in uh, under normal circumstances for cognition. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for these uh, data and speculations and explanations. So we're reaching the the end of this uh, of this edition. Uh, we'll see each other next week at the same time. Uh, Alain Chedetal will be talking, telling us about uh, commissures. So hope to see many of you um, there. Until then, uh, thanks again, Oscar, and everyone have a have a good week and uh, and take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you guys for attending. Bye, Denis. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.